A few episodes ago, we were talking about the Pentagon's 2023 budget submission. And as a result of that episode, we've been invited up to the Hill to talk to Representative Elaine Luria. So let's head over to her office to see what she has to say. So let, let's start by sort of putting your bona fides on the table. I don't know if all my viewers know your pedigree. Um, I grew up in Alabama, in Birmingham, Alabama. Um, it's kind of a long story, but I had been interested in doing something engineering related, had an opportunity to go to the summer seminar at the Naval Academy, fell in love with the Naval Academy. Ironically, didn't get an engineering degree, but did do physics. Um, and graduated from the Naval Academy, became a surface nuclear officer. So basically drove ships, operated nuclear reactors on aircraft carriers for a 20 year career. Um, started that out on a destroyer in Japan, did six ships, and then at the end of my career, I was executive officer on a guided missile cruiser, followed by uh, commanding assault craft unit two, which is all of the amphibious landing craft um, on the East Coast. And I was elected to Congress in 2018. I'm serving about halfway through my second term. I'm the vice chair now on the Armed Services Committee, serve on the Sea Power Subcommittee, also serve on Veterans Affairs, also serve on Homeland Security. And you know these issues are really important to me, not just for their national security reasons um, that I focus on them, but I represent a large portion of Hampton Roads, so the largest naval station in the world. We build all the carriers, half the submarines, and one quarter of the shipbuilding and repair in the entire country happens in our region. So I track all of these issues very closely. So let's talk about your most recent article and, and what you bring up going way back to the national defense strategy and what was happening in 2017 about the number of ships that were codified therein and your conversations with my good friend Admiral Aquilino who I flew with back in the day and my classmate Phil Davidson uh, who I served with again back in the late 90s. So I know that they've said some things and you got cross-threaded with General Milley in testimony and, and some other folks about this. So let, let's let's just talk about uh, what your article brings up with respect to the shipbuilding plan and the 2023 budget submission. Um, so you mentioned a few key players kind of in this, this conversation and both uh, in that as well as their roles um, in the Indo-Pacific. So kind of maybe frame the picture with what uh, has now been kind of coined the Davidson window. Um, so did you make that up or is that... It's, it's been used so frequently, but I think Mike Gallagher kind of started that, you know, mm -hmm. in the in the dialogue, calling it the Davidson window. And for those who aren't familiar, that's really based on testimony that Admiral Davidson gave last year to the Senate Armed Services Committee, essentially saying that it's it's very likely that China could try to take Taiwan by force in the next six years. That's now five years. So it puts that time frame at 2027. And so that's a framing, really, for me, about a lot of these decisions that are made about the budget that we are trying to you know, decide on in the House today. Um, you know, that is really something I think that drives a sense of urgency. And you mentioned you know, the, the questioning of, of General Milley. Uh, I think that we've mitigated risk relative to China. Mm -hmm. And I think that the probability of armed conflict with China, uh, the consequence would be high, but the probability is not high in the near term in terms of this particular budget. Uh, now, as you well, get in the out years, yeah. as you get in the out years, what do you define by? I think out that years? the out years is beyond five years. So okay. beyond so the that does up. not concur with what we've heard from Admiral Davidson and, and Admiral what Admiral Aquilino Davidson and said and Admiral Aquilino said was they said that the probability uh, or the uh, capability of China to attack Taiwan is going to be 2027. Capability, not probability. Okay. And and that is exactly what President Xi charged his military to do. Okay. Well, I would say that myself and many others on this committee interpreted Admiral Aquilino and Davidson's statements differently. But as we're That's limited true. in they time... They were interpreted differently. But what they um, said was the I, capability to attack Taiwan was okay. to be developed by 2027. That's not the same as a decision to attack Taiwan. I think that they said that there was a high probability within the next six years, now five years. And they I've said, had that conversation directly with increased. Admiral Aquilino. At various times, I think more than once, and I have also, you know, in, in other circumstances other than on the record in hearings, and I think there's a big disconnect. I think there's a big disconnect about that sense of urgency that Admiral Davidson, now Admiral Aquilino, who's the commander of U.S. Indo-PACOM, um, what they feel on a day-to-day -day basis, how they are operating, how they are using their forces, the challenges that they have every day, versus what's getting translated through the Pentagon. Because if you ask General Milley the same question, it's not a question that really portrays so much urgency as it does, you know, General Milley, the chairman of the Joint Chiefs, would say, well, they'll have that capability by 2027. But, you know, there's that real discussion in there, like, where's the will? What are the provocative things? What could make the Chinese feel like they need to act? 
And so all of those things, you know, when we talk about the fleet, when we talk about, you know, the uh, recent 30-year shipbuilding plan or the budget request that came from this administration this year and last year, there's some things that don't sync up. You know, if we have a critical time window, now termed the Davidson window, where this conflict is most likely, at the same time, we're getting budgets, 30-year shipbuilding plans, and they seek to shrink the size of the fleet at the time that the threat is most eminent. Um, and so that mismatch has driven a few things over the last, um, you know, last budget cycle, last NDA, which is the defense bill. And now this year we're in this time of year where we do the hearings from all of the, you know, combatant commanders. So Admiral Aquilino has come to speak before Congress. We'll soon be hearing uh, from Navy leadership, the Secretary of the Navy and the Chief of Naval Operations, and really looking to ask them the questions, you know, how does this request, and just to sum it up briefly, it's a request that seeks to decommission 24 ships this year and only build eight. And so you're looking at, you know, maybe not even the number of ships is as important, and that's why I got into this article with um, that's published in SEMSEC. It's also about capacity and capability. So the CNO is really framing everything in readiness, capacity, and capability. Well, you're cutting the number of ships, but if you look at the longer term range, how much capacity and capability are we losing? So I sought to, you know, framed within this Davidson window, analyze. The, those numbers by the number of VLS cells, the vertical launch system cells, um, which are what carry our Tomahawk land attack missiles, our standard missiles, the ASROC, which is anti-submarine rocket, so a, um, a rocket launched uh, torpedo, and the, you know, the main arsenal of our surface ships. And then at the end, you know, also touching on other anti-surface capabilities, of which you know, I think we've you know, been behind um, in the sense that you know, for the most part, the Harpoon remains our main anti-surface weapon um, has a significantly shorter range than equivalent Chinese um, anti-surface missiles do, um, and then the naval strike missile and other capabilities that are being developed. Uh, but if you look during that window, between now and 2027, the number of VLS cells that will be lost by the proposed decommissionings, um, and the platforms we're looking at, cruisers, there's 22 cruisers remaining. The plan that the Navy is proposing decommissions all 22 of those in a very rapid fashion. And then the SSGNs, um, which are submarines that carry the large uh, number um, of uh, missiles, have a large strike capability. Um, if you put those two together um, and you look over the course between now and the time the Davidson window starts, it, you lose about 1,600 VLS cells. And then if you look between now and 2035, you lose 1,980. To put that in perspective, all of our European allies with their capabilities of VLS cells have about 2,300. So, you know, we are losing a significant number of VLS cells capability and, you know, the, the rapid decommissioning um, of the cruisers leads to that. In my article, I made some proposals about how we could look at this differently. Um, you know, some of the cruisers were put in this long-term layup. They're in poor material condition. They're not ships that we need to try to maintain for the long term, but focusing in on the 12 remaining, essentially the 12 that have the most life left are in the best material condition, being able to keep those to 42 years, um, and then use additional other platforms, in this case the EPF, um, as a way to have VLS launchers to increase um, that capability for a much um, lower cost, much more dispersed. The signal it sends, um, if you're looking at having a deterrent, really a deterrence by denial strategy and having that capability to forward deploy all those VLS cells um, is very important. Talk talked to Brian in the previous episode about the difference between deterrence and denial and, and the previous administration versus this administration in sort of general terms. And I did try to touch on that, you know, at the beginning uh, of my article because I do really think that that deterrence by denial um, is as far as the China-Taiwan scenario, that is where we need to be, that's the fleet we need to build. And when you're looking at these budgets that request to essentially slash the capability we have today, if we're looking at a five-year window, we have to flight with the fleet we have today. We can't build new ships during that time frame. We have to use the ships that we have. We have to use them the most efficiently as possible. And then we need to look out at the longer term. So this divest to invest strategy, essentially, that's permeated, not just this administration, but several previous administrations. But the problem is, is we just see divestment, 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 and there's never any investment in that future capability. And you know that has left us in a situation where, you know, with a fleet of about 298 today, we'll rapidly be at 280. Um, yet, you mentioned what happened in 2017, Congress codified into law that we should have a 355 ship navy, of which 11 aircraft carriers, and you know, we're not on a trajectory to reach that. 
um, the 30-year shipbuilding plan that was recently released. Um, I question a little bit about being a, a plan when it has three options. I feel like it's kind of choose your own adventure. Um, you know, one plan seemed like let's go heavy on surface. The next plan was, you know, let's emphasize submarines. And then the final plan I feel like was kind of a throwaway plan because it was ambitious in a way that, you know, I don't think that the Navy was really saying we're coming to Congress to ask you to do this. But I feel like we're not really leveraging our full industrial base. I mean, for example, um, you know, the DDGs, the Arleigh Burke class destroyers, you know, that's the ship that we're building on time and on budget right now, and we can build them, uh, and we can build easily two a year, and we can build, you know, we could realistically ramp up to three a year. So just an example of last year's budget, they came to Congress and only asked for one destroyer. And so it was this real, you know, everybody's saying through the course of all of our hearings, we need to build the size of the Navy, China's our number one threat, we need to have forces so that we can have presence, so that we can have deterrence. Um, yet it was a budget that sought to shrink the size of the Navy again. So what it ended up happening um, was, you know, I worked um, with a group of Republicans, Mike Rogers, the ranking member from Alabama, um, you know, came together to add $24 billion to the defense budget. A large portion of that added um, amount went to building two destroyers, went to speeding up the class of, of construction of Virginia class submarines, went to adding additional resources to the Pacific Defense Initiative, and we, in last year's NDA, preserved two of the cruisers of the seven they wanted to decommission, but they're right back again trying to, you know, decommission um, some of those same ships more rapidly even than they were before. As you're speaking, I'm, I'm left wondering why is the CNO going this way? What struck me as I watched your exchange in testimony with General Milley was he was arguing semantics, in essence, about verb tenses. And as we're trying to parse out what was the actual thing that Davidson and Aquilino said, I don't know how the chairman wouldn't be biased towards being ready today. And this is kind of the lesson of the Russian invasion of Ukraine. You know, this is what we know. Uh, as a function of our Naval Academy education, is you don't get to pick when the test comes. And so it just seemed like the chairman was sort of saying, yeah, we're just going to, the thing ain't going to happen for five years. And so divest to invest, which is kind of a too cute by half bumper sticker to my eye, um, is just what it is. So you're about to talk to CNO. Uh, he's about to testify. What do you think he's going to say in defense of this strategy? Well, maybe back up kind of a few years in this. I mean, because we, we actually got a 30-year shipbuilding plan this year. There have been years, um, you know, through the cycle that I've been in Congress. I've only, it's only my fourth NDA where we didn't even have a 30-year shipbuilding plan. And what I would say about the previous administration is there was a lot of talk about building up the Navy, um, but not really the action to follow that, but then Battle Force 2045, which was an ambitious shipbuilding plan, um, came out very close to the end of the administration, but really with no possibility in that time frame, September. Yeah, I, I don't know where that 355 number came from, really, because when I was talking to principals in the Department of the Navy, they were like, we got no plan to 355. Mm -hmm. And then when Battle Force 2045 came out, it actually overshot that. Um, in the sense that they started counting and adding in a significant Drones. number of unmanned vessels. Um, we probably need a whole other episode to address yes. that issue. <laughs> um, but, you know, I want to kind of go back um, to what I realized, you know, through the hearings over the course of you know, four years now, is that nothing is ever presented to us in the framework of a strategy. And this caused me to do a lot of, you know, sort of, research, watching old hearings, essentially, you know, from the 1980s when John Lehman was testifying, and kind of understanding how the 1980s maritime strategy, how it was portrayed differently, how the message was communicated to Congress, how did, during the Reagan administration, um, how was the support garnered from the top, from the president on down through the administration? Essentially, we need a 600-ship Navy to defeat the Soviet Union, we're going to go build that. And you know why, although every military leader comes and says that today, do the budgets, which are statements of policy, not match that? Um, and so I feel like everything is done backwards. And you know, John Lehman will say that, and it, it's really obvious that it should flow this way. You should have the strategy, and the strategy should drive that with the requirements, and then from those requirements come the POM and the budget. I feel like everything's backwards now. So essentially, you know, there's a top line that's given to the Department of Defense, just being very basic. It's split into three pieces, Army, Navy, Air Force, and that's not exactly right, but generally. 
And so the Navy has their slice of the pie. And they have to say, well, what can we do within these constraints? And the problem with that is, is the real world counts. And you have to look at where do you actually need the preponderance of your resources. And if you look right now, um, you know, and China's our number one threat, it's a maritime theater, and the Navy and the Air Force need a larger portion of those resources. And then if you look beyond that as well, what's the number one priority of the Department of Defense? It's building the Columbia-class submarine, which is part of our nuclear deterrent. So, and the nuclear deterrent is the cornerstone of our defense, so we have to be able to build that leg of the nuclear triad in order to replace the Ohio-class submarines um, as they age out. Yet that is completely falling on the Navy's shipbuilding budget. So where are the things that you can flex? Can you take some of that off the Navy? The Congress authorized a, um, a sea-based strategic deterrent fund several years ago before I came to Congress, but it's been authorized, but it's never been funded. So what are the things can we do to kind of free up more of those resources to the Navy to actually do the shipbuilding that's necessary to have the Navy that we need to provide a credible deterrent? And on top of that, you know, in Congress, it's really easy to get people excited about the next shiny new thing that we're going to buy or build, but I also feel that we don't invest enough in the infrastructure necessary to maintain those things, um, whether that's directly in the shipyards, in the maintenance availabilities, you know, in all of the things. And if you look at the cruisers, for example, I mean, that's, it's a travesty what happened over the life of that class of ships, because um, truly the most capable platform in our lifetime, I mean, when I came into the Naval Academy in 93, I feel like the ships we were operating really evolved out of Cold War and Cold War missions, but we never built a replacement for the cruiser. I notionally said, you know, let's convert 13 that we have, let's add eight more. And you could really build eight additional EPFs for the cost of one DDG Flight 3. And so, you know, there's not only the cost issue, but like whether the sort of creativity, creative ideas that we can in the very short time frame that we need to be focusing on. So I feel like, as you said, this goes way back. When we were fielding LCS, DDG-1000, sort of a build it and then we'll figure out what we're going to do with it. We didn't do what you're talking about in terms of the John Lehman way that you build a fleet, not to mention uh, fund a fleet. And it seems like to go way back to, again, our Naval Academy training, Lehman is a big student of Mahan. And Mahan was all about, you've got to sell the need for a Navy to the American public. And I think that's what we're not doing. So we can jump up and down about China as the pacing threat and that sort of thing. But I don't think anybody really thinks that that's, you know, imminent. And I don't think it's getting translated to the top. Admiral Aquilino has not directly briefed the president. So is, as his combatant commander in the Indo-PACOM AOR, these are very complex scenarios, and there's a lot of questions about authorities. If you're going to deter by denial, decisions have to be made essentially before a fait accompli action date. But why is that? Is that because the president hasn't asked for that meeting? I don't know that all the inside details of it, but I've been asking about this for about a year. Um, and I know from Admiral Aquilino, from General Milley, from others that, you know, to my knowledge, and that that, that that briefing hasn't taken place. And I think that General Milley feels that, you know, the information coming out of the Pentagon is sufficiently preparing the president with the information he needs about this scenario. But in my mind, just where you contrast Admiral Davidson's testimony and General Milley's response to my questions, the sense of urgency is not being translated. Yeah, absolutely not. And so I think that there's a lot of information that is necessary to come directly from the commander to the commander-in-chief about the decisions that need to be made. And I also think, and this may be beyond the scope of what we have time to talk about today, there's a lot of questions about authorities as well related to this. So, and that ties into the question of you know, strategic ambiguity, is that still the right stance? Um, if you look at authorities within the War Powers Act. You mean with respect to Taiwan? Is that what you're saying? If you think about a scenario where we're going to deter China, we're going to prevent them from invading Taiwan. So what do you have to do to prevent them? You have to have a credible force there. You have to have presence. But what is essentially the, the trigger point that you could say you have the authority to take action to prevent them? You imagine an amphibious assault you know, across the strait, 140 nautical miles roughly. A decision has to be made. Um, and in what time frame can that decision be made? And the president, can he make that decision? He can't make that decision. He has to come to Congress to make that decision. Because under the War Powers Act, you can act in self-defense, um, but you can't introduce forces in an area where hostilities are imminent. Um, so there's a scenario where, as you know, say there's 
indication that China is massing forces in order to take action, we can't just introduce more forces there at that particular moment without congressional authority. So there's this question of authorities, essentially, that would even allow us to use the force that we have that can counter uh, Chinese aggression is not fully addressed. And I think that's wrapped up a lot in this question of strategic ambiguity. I mean, our policy since 1979 has been strategic ambiguity. We won't, we won't, we won't clarify, you know, um, whether we would come to the aid of Taiwan. But I think we need real, a real change in that to say we have strategic clarity. The United States will come to the assistance of Taiwan to maintain the status quo. I think that part is important because sure. we're not advocating for Taiwanese independence, but you know, the United States will come to the aid of Taiwan. And you just mentioned a few minutes ago, well, do the American people really have the will to do this? That's a big factor. Yeah. So what are your constituents saying? What are you hearing with respect to their priorities? Um, so I get this question a lot. I actually was touring a local factory, a planter's peanut production facility yesterday, and a man came up to me and he said, I am just very concerned about China and China and Taiwan, and I'm seeing you talking all the time about them shrinking the Navy. What are we going to do about it? I mean, you're familiar with Hampton Roads. I think people in our area are very attuned to these kind of issues, maybe more than in other areas of the country. Um, but I would certainly say that I hear on people's mind that when they hear that the budget is seeking to shrink the size of the Navy at a time when there is really an imminent need to and continue to grow the Navy's capability, capacity, readiness, if you want to use the terms that the, the CNO is using most, more recently, so they're just very concerned um, that it seems like that's going in the wrong direction at a very critical time. What are the immediate action? steps that you would like to see the Pentagon, SecDef, take with respect to the 2023 budget submission, the priorities with the Navy's focus? Going into this cycle and really understanding the studies that were done over the last couple of years, um, we needed to see 3 to 5 percent real growth. But that was the target of where we would see real growth over inflation. So if you see 4 percent, just a flat four percent across the board, you know, that is not achieving the growth that, you know, is been analyzed to be necessary. Um, and when you look at how, you know, kind of once that top line goes into the Pentagon, comes out the other side and it's allocated, um, when I would say there's a paucity of resources going into shipbuilding and ship repair and maintaining the fleet that we need for our you know, number one threat, which is a maritime theater, we have to add resources. So immediately upon seeing this budget, upon seeing the plan to decommission 24 ships and only build eight, you know, I went right back to Mike Rogers, who's the Republican ranking member, and said, you know, here we are again, like we're going to go through this process again. And to kind of put it in perspective from last Congress, the Senate also added $24 billion, and they went ahead of us in marking up the bill. And when they added $24 billion, it was just essentially take the unfunded list, $24 billion, draw the line here, everything above the line gets added. On the House side, I think we were very deliberate about focusing on the Pacific, and like I said, the Pacific Deterrence Initiative, PDI, as well as you know the particular platforms and ships and aircraft that we made sure that there was an additional investment in last year. So I think that this time around, the full focus will be on those things that we need to add um, in order to support the Indo-PACOM uh, AOR. But if you kind of went back to the, you know, dividing that pie differently, I don't think the only answer is continuing to raise the top line. I think we do need to see, you know, increases over time, but I also think we need to see a variation in the allocations. But, you know, I would say that we truly, you know, to get where we need to be with the current threats that we have and with regards to, you know, China's increased aggression against Taiwan, the additional need for presence in the Pacific, that we're going to need to get to about 5% of GDP. And that's basically where we were in the Reagan administration. We're only at about 3.6 now. Um, and then with this year's plus up, I mean, we're getting closer to four. Um, but truly, I think that, that that is where the investments that we are going to need to make because of some of the choices and the investments we didn't make in the past, in shipbuilding specifically. As we ask for more ships, what's your sense of our capacity to build more ships? So. HII in Newport News 
you know, they're building carriers, Virginia-class submarines, well, they're with, in combination with electric boat building Virginia-class submarines. And the goal is to reach three Virginia-class a year between the two shipyards, and they actually alternate between shipyards because they build it in segments, assemble them and alternating between Connecticut and Virginia. And then the Columbia-class submarine. I mean, there is a lot of work going on at Newport News right now. Not only the shipbuilding, but there's two carriers and they're refueling overhaul. So my assessment is it's going to be hard to ramp up that production at Newport News much more. Um, but when we're talking about the surface fleet, I think there's a lot of capacity out there to do more. Um, you know, the, between Bath, Maine and Pascagoula for the destroyers, for example, you know, we're building at about a two per year rate. We could be ramping that up. We're bringing the new frigate program online in Wisconsin. We need to identify a second yard in order to increase the frigate production at the, the right time. I think we need to have uh, a variety of other platforms. I mean, we really don't have a small vessel with a lot of firepower. So you can buy a lot of less expensive vessels with a lot of firepower, have them dispersed. So in that guise of small missile boats, well, there's shipyards on the Gulf Coast, there's shipyards around the country that can build those kind of platforms. We just have to have the will to build you're, them. You're just saying that though, the first thing that comes to mind is we wasted so much time with LCS. That's what LCS was supposed to be, right? That was Admiral Sabrowski's dream, Street Fighter. This thing, a small boat with a lot of firepower. Yeah, but I'm thinking even smaller. But yet, you know, the LCS is at the heart of part of this question about decommissionings, because this year's budget requests to decommission nine LCS. I was, I'm not wedded to that platform, but you know, when you have a platform and it has a utility and it can be used in a theater where you can substitute that for then having to bring a higher end capability platform in to do the job. So if you get rid of all these LCSs in Mayport, now you gotta have DDGs go do any sort of counter drug operations or anything else in Southcom AOR. And so, you know, it didn't work out how we wanted with the three different, you know, mission modules. There have been engineering problems. Um, so, I mean, I think that's a debate that we'll have, you know, over the course of this NDAA. Um, but my thought in this, Davidson window sense of urgency is, you know, if I were the CNO, I'd be trying to make use of every platform I have in every way possible and retain the platforms I have, because I'm not going to be able to build really on anything that's making a significant contribution in that window above and beyond what I have today. And once, and especially when you do the math, because you naturally are going to be losing ships um, during that time frame, you know, because of their age or decommissioning that comes due. So. Based on what you just said about LCS, Let's take the conversation to 30,000 feet about procurement, the process in general. Uh, of course, you have a fiduciary responsibility to shepherd taxpayers' dollars in efficient ways. But put on your warfighter hat when you were on you know, your nuclear surface ship and you needed a thing or you're using a legacy thing that's aging out and you felt frustration with how long it takes to field weapons, to field platforms. What's wrong there? What can be fixed? Is this just the way it is because it has to be? Talk to me about your impressions about the procurement system. Well, um, you know, kind of where I've put my thought a lot is not as much in just sort of the procurement mechanism. Um, but I do, as a tangent, have you know, doubts about like, why did we decide to build an FFG? in the sense that we're building a platform that costs two-thirds as much as a DDG but only has one-third of the capability. And not only that, the one-third of the capability, I'm just basing that off the number of VLS cells, but those VLS cells don't actually carry Tomahawk either. So what's the answer? Um, so I can't answer why those decisions were made in the past, um, but I am trying to drive the discussion in the direction of what can we do that is actually cost-efficient, can be done rapidly, brings greater capacity, um, and really meets the needs of the theater that's our current theater. I mean, if you think about, I mean, over the course of my entire career, what were we doing? We were supporting ground wars in Iraq and Afghanistan. Um, so the Navy didn't have a peer competitor. We were not really laser focused on anti-submarine warfare. Anti-air warfare was really defense of the carrier and the carrier strike group. Um, or maybe, you know, low slow flyer threats. I mean, things that, you know, are not the scale of a potential future conflict with China and their capabilities. So we didn't really build towards platforms that supported that. And we also, I don't think, trained towards that. Um, so we're now in a situation where I think we took our eye off the ball. You know, the Navy was trying to be relevant in ground wars in Iraq and Afghanistan, and of course provided massive amounts of you know air support and critical roles in those theaters. But at the same time, 
didn't make the investments, you're talking about procurement, investments, procurements to keep the force, you know, on pace with in numbers, capability and capacity with China, obviously, which we, we took our eye off the ball on, on their development. So that you didn't really answer the question. Yeah, oh, procurement. Oh, so I mean, going beyond that, I personally think, and it's not the first time it's ever been tried, but I think the long-term path we need to go down is we really need to look at Goldwater Nichols because this all started, and it all goes back, and I can loop it into my conversation before about like the lack of a strategy. Well, the death of naval strategy was essentially after John Lehman, Goldwater Nichols, and, and kind of this direction that we've gone. And, and I don't want to portray that everything with Goldwater Nichols is bad. I mean, I think our ability to improve joint operations and joint interoperability and capabilities, but when it comes to procurement-related decisions, I think that there are many things that need to be looked at. And I mean, I think we're like 36 years on now with Goldwater Nichols. Um, so really a longer-term goal of mine. Um, and I fully acknowledge people have tried to tackle this before. John McCain uh, did. I've seen testimony where Michelle Flournoy was testifying, you know, about some of the things within Goldwater Nichols that needed to be revisited. But I really do think a just holistic baseline review of where we came from, where we are, and essentially is it still serving our needs to meet today's demands that should be driving procurement. Because I don't really think there's a feedback loop. I don't feel like there's a very good feedback loop between what the combatant commander needs and what we're buying. And that, that seems to be broken, and I can't answer everything right now, but I think that that really bears a full analysis of how we can improve that. Your article also mentions the, the Kath Hicks getting to less white paper that arguably has informed the Biden strategy about budgets and priorities therein. And a cynic could say, well, that was reverse engineered so that the priorities could be social programs and other parts of the Biden agenda other than the China threat. Was that paper right? In, in, or was that, was that a, a bad strategy for uh, this administration to sort of latch on to? It was a very bad strategy. Um, and I don't know if you want to go more in depth on essentially the interim national security strategy we have, or right now yeah, the yes. unclassified um, you know, one and a half page summary of the national defense strategy. Um, but you know, the more I look at and think about this concept of integrated deterrence, I think it's very problematic. It's kind of like Roosevelt's, you know, speak softly and carry a big stick, right? But you know, you're looking at integrated deterrence. What are we integrating? Who is integrating? Who is leading in this effort? You don't really define supported and supporting commanders in this. Um, you know, essentially, you know, the speak softly part, you have all the other levers of government, um, state, economic, agriculture, energy, like all of the other departments that interface and have roles in setting our national, um, you know, foreign policy and have impacts on national security issues. And so that's the speak softly. But then you would who who is the supported commander in that it's like you speak softly but you carry the big stick but when you need the big stick you know what that is that's hard power and that is and what is the military's role in integrated deterrence it's hard power it's combat credible forces that are ready trained equipped and ready to go and can fight and win the nation's wars all the things that you hear all of those words over and over again and you know every testimony from our leadership of the military um, but you intermesh this, speak softly, carry a big stick, you put it in the national defense strategy, so everybody in the Department of Defense is now trying to look for their role in integrated deterrence. You know, you don't want the military to be speaking softly. They're your big stick. You need them when you need them. And so you, you've got, like, no supported commander, and then it switches over big stick time, right, because you have a conflict. You, nobody wants to go to war, but when you actually need that force, it's clear that the military is the supported commander and everyone else is supporting, but I think that what's really missing in there is like why is integrated deterrence one of the top three things that you're talking about in the national defense strategy? Integrated deterrence, campaigning, you can talk about that a little bit. They're like buzzwords. And then whatever that third thing is, right? I'm kind of a grammar nerd. Can I get a little bit into what I think about campaigning? Sure. Okay. The word campaign. Okay, it can be a noun and a verb. Okay, so campaign as a noun really has two definitions. 
One of those definitions is a military operation with a defined objective. One is campaign in the sense of like a political campaign, change hearts and minds. Now campaign is a verb, it really only has one meaning as a verb, and that is a social and political movement, a campaign. Okay, so you've taken campaign, the noun with the military meaning, you've added ing to the end of it, you've called it campaigning, like it's as though it's a noun form of a verb, a gerund, you know. So you've got this campaigning thing, but it's not really a word, grammatically, or by the definition in the dictionary. So it's like, you know, young people, millennials these days, they come up with these words like adulting is now a verb. So for Department of Defense, campaigning, in a military sense, campaigning is now one of the top three things we're talking about in our national defense strategy. But what is it? And when you create your own words, you just create your own definition. So nobody knows what it is. And so you have integrated deterrence and you have campaigning, but you can combine those, so you have integrated campaigning. So the, we should just, in Department of Defense and our budget and making decisions based on national defense strategy should base that off of what is the role of the military. It's hard power. All these other things are just distractions. And they're trying to, I think, redefine the narrative with buzzwords so you know, the people who are, like in Catholic's, you know, essay from a few years ago, white paper, um, trying to justify why we're going to spend less on defense, why we need less power, why all these other levers of government can do more and we can do less in defense, and I think that's the wrong direction. So as the final thought, let me ask you to just sort of give us some impressions of being a lawmaker. Is this what you thought it would be? Um, what, what, what's, what's, what has the experience been like? Definitely different in a lot of ways than being an officer in the Navy. Um, I would think that um, you know, there's not at all sort of this you know, hierarchical chain of command type environment within Congress. You know, everyone's a lawmaker. Everyone in the body has the same vote. Um, and so there's really a very important aspect of building coalitions around particular issues, finding people who are like-minded on certain issues, and sometimes finding those people in like unlikely places. You know, what are things about your district that are similar characteristics to other districts? You know, do I talk to all the other members who have shipbuilding and ship repair and naval installations in their district? Of course. Do I talk to other members who have ports? Yes. Do I talk to other members who are trying to work on advanced nuclear, offshore wind? You know, so you you find these areas and you find people. For for whatever their reason, interest, connection to their district is to have sort of like-minded um, you know, goals on certain issues. So it's really a, a, a process, you know, when you come to Congress as a, as a legislator, you know, it takes a while to build those connections, to make those relationships. And, you know, one of the things that I get asked most frequently is like, is it as crazy in DC as we see on television? And I mean, the truth is really it's not. I mean, if you're a follower of things that happen on the Armed Services Committee, um, you know, for the most part, incredibly bipartisan. You know, I just, I talked a lot about how we got the 24 billion added last year. That only happened in a bipartisan way. We actually really only could have passed the NDAA, the defense bill, um, last year in a bipartisan way. Um, and I foresee that, you know, this year's defense bill will be very part bipartisan as well. Um, and Veterans Affairs Committee, where I serve as well, also very bipartisan. So, um, you know, I think there is a lot of working together on these critical issues that doesn't necessarily always get portrayed <laughs> um, to the public. So. Well, Representative Elaine Luria, thank you for your continued service to the nation, and thanks for allowing us to come into your office and have this conversation today. Great. Well, thank you, and stop by any time. <laughs> Maybe I'll stop by and see you in Annapolis again great. next time. <laughs> thank you. All right, that'll do it for this episode. Please subscribe, like, and comment. Check the links below for merch. If you'd like to help support the channel, please consider using the super thanks, the heart icon below, or become a patron at patreon.com slash wardcarroll. And in the meantime, I look forward to talking to you again very soon.